So um, obviously we are here today to talk about pest and disease management, and that is a little bit of a loaded topic. So it's one of those things that uh, we can often get really into the weeds, excuse the pun, um, when talking about plant care. Uh, unfortunately, as with everything else in the plant world, there is always both good and bad things that can happen, uh, insect, disease, fungi, um, there's a lot of interaction within our ecosystem, and that's one thing we have to kind of keep in mind, that we don't, uh, we're not growing things in a vacuum. Um, one of the big concepts that I, more misconceptions, I would say, that I try to steer people away from uh, is really that idea that we can sterilize or we can get rid of, or um, we are starting with no problems right off the bat. Um, that's always the question I get, where did this come from? Um, well, it's likely always been there. We just have created the right conditions for it. And so kind of keeping that in mind, we're going to go ahead and get started um, to kind of give you an outline of what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to start with integrated pest management. So integrated pest management, obviously, um, is the very core concept of how, how cooperative extension focuses on um, pest and disease management. And the, the entire core concept of an integrated pest management is reducing the needs for um, chemicals, reducing the needs um, for inputs, and of course, trying to create a more sustainable um, methodology. And of course, adding on to that, we are going to talk a little bit about attracting beneficial insects. So of course, attracting beneficial insects um, specifically, when we talk about pests, beneficial insects are very, very important uh, as far as the garden goes. One of the big concepts that I want everyone to kind of go away from is, is we're not trying to, again, going back to that sterilization, we're, we're not trying to sterilize the garden. Um, what we're trying to do is create a balance. And so beneficial insects are a huge part of that balance. And of course, then we'll really dive into just some common pests and diseases that you will see. Um, specific really to vegetables today, um, but hopefully we'll kind of touch on a little bit for fruits as well. So integrated pest management, what specifically is it? Um, this is a, it's very much just a decision-based uh, process. And so the entire concept is, is we are looking at a, a plant, we are determining there is a problem, we are then identifying the problem, and then looking into a step-by-step -step process in which we are going to either control or mitigate the problem itself. Um, this is a very, I, I would say it's a little bit more esoteric concept, mostly because it's not just what do I spray, um, what do I do, that kind of thing. It's more of a, all right, we need to look at this as a whole system approach. Um, it's probably one of the, the harder concepts, I think, for even more experienced gardeners like myself um, to really focus on. And so I, I, I understand that sometimes we don't always go through the exact process correctly. Um, but the idea is, is we're trying to combine all our tools in our toolbox in order to really make the most impact without the most cost. Um, it's really, really probably the best way to focus on that. And of course, our goal, it's all about the ecological approach um, as I said, really right at the beginning, this is a whole system approach. This is everything is interconnected. When we talk about fungi, they are a part of the soil web, the food web. Um, when we talk about insects, they are part of, of course, soil and food web. Um, these are all aspects of what we would call an ecosystem. And even if we're talking about a little four by four raised bed, it is still a ecosystem that we are talking about. We Again, we're not growing things in a vacuum. So trying to really focus on that ecological approach to eliminate or at least reduce the use of various different chemicals, uh, re reduce our dependency on products that unfortunately don't have a long-term use. Um, a lot of times when we talk about things like um, various different insecticides, these are things that eventually the insects are going to become resistant to. We're running into that. Um, it's kind of similar to the concept of antibiotics. Antibiotics, of course, we're running out of them mostly because that's just our go-to when it comes to um, bacterial infections. And unfortunately, bacteria, like with a lot of things we're going to talk about today, 
um, will become resistant. And so this approach is going to reduce that chance. Uh, one more thing I want to mention real quick. We are not talking about complete elimination or eradication. Um, probably the best thing to do as a gardener in general or growing anything is to be okay with some, some pest and disease. We'll start with that. Obviously, there's there are a tremendous amount of benefits. Uh, frankly, it's just the reduce. Um, frankly, it's the reducing cost, uh, and and not just monetarily, but monetarily really right off the bat. Um, so I, I tend to do a whole lot of um, growing things for both work and for for pleasure. And I will say it, it makes it a lot more pleasurable when I don't have to spend nearly as much money on dealing with the problems. And so a lot of times kind of creating that whole system approach is a much more beneficial way to do so. And again, it reduces a whole lot of other things. We're not affecting the water quality as much. We're really not being as hazardous to the wildlife. And as I said, we're not just talking when you kill one insect, you are affecting that entire system, birds, the mammals, other insects. So it's it's really a big thing to kind of keep in mind. Everything is affected when we touch one thing. And so the less we destroy, the less we kill, a lot of times the better we are with everything. Okay. So what is the process? And again, you're going to hear me kind of um, emphasize this process specifically because in reality, we can't talk about pests and disease without talking about how to control them um, ecologically. And so again, this is why I am focused on this. Um, so right off the bat, IPM process, the first thing we have to do is monitor. Um, there are generally, I am actually hoping uh, in the future to host a in-person pest and disease management workshop where we can actually look at pest and disease, but um, finding somewhere that has a high enough population that can house enough people uh, can sometimes be difficult. But there are, of course, devices that I encourage everyone to have. And one of them, it's it's called a jeweler's loop. Um, so it's basically a little magnifying glass that you can purchase for about $15 off Amazon. Um, it doesn't have to be the super fancy um, 30X. It can be just a 15 or 20X. Um, but essentially what it is, is it's a magnifying glass in order to really get and look at things a little bit more up close. And so those jeweler's loops, um, it's L-O-U-P-E, specifically how to spell it. Um, but those are very helpful, in, is, especially when we're talking about diseases and we're looking into some of the different fungal growth, some of the different fruiting bodies, things like that. Um, and of course, same with kind of that insect. When we're looking at the eggs, it's a lot easier to see what those eggs look like when we look at it really up close. Uh, and of course, once we are monitoring, so as I said, the best thing to do right off the bat is just you want to look at your plants once a day. It's kind of that um, that tale, you know, talk to your plants to, to help them grow. In reality, putting eyes on your plant at least once a day is extremely beneficial. Um, I think a lot of times farmers struggle with this, mostly because they have too much to look at all at once. So they can't kind of put that same one-on-one -on -one effort into it. So we're talking about smaller situations. It does help because we can really inspect everything. You don't have to look over it under every leaf, but it does help to really get an idea of, does that plant just look healthy? Uh, and that's kind of one of the big things is understanding what does healthy look like versus unhealthy. Um, and then once we find the problems, then we have to identify them. Um, there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, we're going to kind of talk mostly about those identifying methods specifically um, after we get through kind of what this process is. Um, but that's really the next step. You want to be monitoring consistently, but then you want to identify or at least know where to go to identify these specific organisms or even abiotic issues that may pop up that we will talk a little bit about. And of course, um, we then want to evaluate the seriousness of a problem. Uh, and I always love to use uh, several examples. So if you hear me use an example, um, I apologize. But uh, so one of the big issues that I ran into this year um, is I plant a lot of gara. It's a very good, um, it's not native to here, but it's native to the southeast. So it, it works enough, um, but it is a really good pollinator plant. It attracts bees like crazy. It's also known as whirling butterflies. 
Now, Malaya had aphids all over it, um, similar to my milkweed, which unfortunately might have actually killed the milkweed, though it is slowly coming back, I think. Um, but aphids, aphids, of course, are, are a piercing, sucking insect that can do a lot of damage. They uh, reproduce very fast. Um, and they can, again, get to a very serious level very quickly, but they also are kind of picky eaters. So if, if they're on one plant, they're not going to jump to the next unless it's the same species. So um, that's kind of one thing to keep in mind. The nice thing is, is I instead of going out and treating for those aphids, what I did was allowed any beneficials to have a consistent food source. Um, the gar is now reblooming. The aphids are gone. Uh, and I will tell you, I have a lot more beneficial insects. So sometimes the seriousness of the problem is a little bit relative, but you want to determine if any management is warranted whatsoever. And then, of course, choosing the appropriate control measures, which is what we're going to do next. So identification, we're going to really dive a little bit more into that. But the first thing to do is always look at where the symptoms are. Um, are they on the leaves? Are they on the stem? Are they on the whole plant, the plant wilting? Um, that's usually an indication of root issues. Um, so this is one of the things we want to first look at what plant's being affected. Um, it's a lot easier to know what the problem is, is if you know the plant species itself. Um, if I know that I have uh, yellow crookneck squash, um, it's a lot easier to know, okay, it's a specific problem. It could be uh, squash fine borer, it could be um, aphids, it could be white fly, it could be a number of things, as opposed to just saying it's a vegetable. Um, so really getting specific on the crop is going to be one of the first things to help narrow down what the problem is. And then you want to look at kind of what the damage is, is as well. Now, again, some symptoms can often be very similar to each other. That's why it can sometimes be hard to just look at a plant and say this is what's going on. A wilted plant, like you see on the on the picture there, could actually be three to four to five different problems. Um, I have seen those exact symptoms on plants that are just too dry, um, lack of water. I've seen that with nematode um, infestations. I've seen this with, of course, squash vine borer. Uh, and then, of course, I've seen this with um, various different root rots, phytophthoras, things like that. Um, and so all those problems can cause the exact same symptoms, which means just those symptoms, unfortunately, are not going to be enough. So that's where we start to look for other signs. What does our soil look like? What has been done to the plant? What have, are, or do I see any insect signs? Do I see any um, fungal growth? Things like that. Those are all going to be signs to help narrow down more what that problem is. And of course, always look for secondary symptoms. Um, the picture on the left is a um, is actually got two different problems. The one on the top uh, is actually going to be downy mildew. You have to look at the bottom of the leaf for it versus the one at the bottom is um, going to be fertilizer burn, uh, which is actually a problem I ran into uh, fairly recently. Someone just left fertilizer on the leaves of their plants instead of um, uh, scraping it off. And so um, it is always good to kind of look for the secondary symptoms. And of course, as with everything in gardening, keep records. Um, this helps to really determine, hey, did I fertilize recently? Have I been watering correctly? Have we gotten a lot of rain? This will be very helpful, not only to figure out what's going on this year, but in future years, you can look back on this specific season and say, hey, I noticed that same problem after we had a lot of rain. Um, helps you kind of pick up on patterns and things like that. And of course, when in doubt, you can always reach out to your external resources, such as myself. Understand the crop. So um, as one of the first things that I learned when I uh, did anything when it came to health was you have to first determine what healthy looks like. Um, so we, we can't really determine there's a problem or what the problem is without knowing that there is one. And then thus, we have to know exactly what healthy looks like. And so... Um, you must understand exactly what that is that plant supposed to climb is that plant supposed to wilt is that plant supposed to um, drop leaves there is a lot of things to get into exactly what is going on and this is going to all help indicate exactly all right is this plant healthy or not and of course not only that you have to then figure out um, is this crop susceptible to anything 
so you heard me mention um, yellow or yellow crookneck squash specifically um, that had gotten, I, I mean, squash vine borer is very, very common that has a, a hollow stem, hence the reason why it gets it more, um, as opposed to a lot of your other cucurbits, things like your cucumbers, your winter squashes, certain ones, um, those don't get it nearly as much because it's not necessarily as susceptible. And again, that's understanding the crop is also understanding what is it susceptible to. And then understanding what stress would look like, um, heat and drought stress, fertility. Um, these are all things to really understand. Is is my plant ye having yellow leaves and um, not flowering because I'm not fertilizing enough or is it because I actually have a serious issue? And so again, these are all very important steps. Um, really, this kind of focuses exclusively on that cultural control. And what does cultural control mean? Of course, um, that is going to be, that is just making sure your plants are as healthy as possible. All right, so you've got two pictures here. One on the left is healthy potatoes. One on the right is unhealthy potatoes. Um, this is a good example of what, and I'll go back to it real quick. Um, on the right, you can see those yet browning leaves. Um, this is a good example of understanding your environment. So understanding the environment, of course, um, obviously knowing that, hey, it's July 13th. Um, so the fact that it's going to be 94 today, that you're, you're expecting that because, again, it's middle of July in low country, South Carolina. So extreme heat. Uh, if it's January 3rd, I'm probably going to be worried about frost. Um, of course, if we're not getting a whole lot of rain, which here it's a lot harder because it's no consistent consistency to it. Um, of course, understanding is there going to be drought stress and of course, too much rain, which is much more common, especially in the past couple weeks. Um, that can also lead to disease. So there's a whole lot of just understanding your environment uh, and sometimes understanding kind of what problems can come from those. And then, of course, then we uh, now need to determine what a pest is. So not all insects, weeds, or other organisms are pests. Pest is a very relative term. Theoretically, other humans can be called pests. So you have to be kind of understanding that the term pest doesn't always mean the same thing for everyone. And so for me, um, I generally consider if it's damaging the plants to the point where I am not going to get what I want from it, I consider that a pest. Um, right off the bat, things like your aphids, white flies, certain funguses can be considered pests. I usually get a lot of questions regarding mushrooms. Um, obviously, fungi tend to evoke the concept of disease, but a lot of the mushrooms that we see are actually not pestiferous at all. They're completely beneficial um, and or neutral. And so it's really good to kind of determine, are these even worth thinking about, worrying about? Seeing a bug in the garden or an insect in the garden is not call for concern. Usually, um, in fact, nine times out of 10, seeing an insect in the garden is a good sign that you have an overall healthy garden because that means there's actually something to eat. Um, that being said, do you want to get a little bit more familiar with some of the more common insect issues that you may run into? So I do want to mention bio biotic versus abiotic. Biotic just means that it's living. So is it caused by another living thing? If it's not, if it's caused by the environment, then it is, of course, abiotic. Abiotic just means it's caused by situation. That's really all it is. Heat, drought, stress, nutrient deficiency, soil compaction, improper pruning, sun scald, a whole lot of things that can come of that. Um, it is really, again, understanding, is it living or is it not? So you look at that picture, that's fertilizer burn, um, which understanding, okay, right off the bat, that's blueberries. Blueberries, of course, get, um, they're sensitive to salt. If I over fertilize them with nitrogen, you can get the burning like you see there. And so that is kind of a good indication, okay, it's likely not insect or disease. Um, a couple other things we'll get into, but um, the whole lot you can dive into as far as that goes. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, understanding the pest real quick. So obviously there, um, and I say obviously, but there are two types of pests that we're going to really kind of discuss, direct and indirect 
Um, so direct just means that it's affecting the crop specifically, and indirect means it's affecting the plant, which will then affect the crop. So it's kind of that, um, you know, goes around the bush to, in order to get to the front. Um, so generally, when it comes to indirect pests, they are, in my opinion, much more damaging because it tends to hurt or damage the plant in some way, as opposed to things like your direct pests, like your hornworms, pickleworms, stink bugs, a whole lot of things that can affect the fruits um, for the most part. So it's kind of good, good to know exactly where it's going to affect. And then, of course, understanding disease. And um, I, I tend to teach this whenever I talk about um, plant pathology. Uh, but in reality, to understand the basics of plant pathology, in my opinion, is to understand the disease triangle, uh, which just means that there are three parts that come together in order to produce a disease. Um, pathogen, yes, the bacteria, fungus, virus, or nematode. Um, your environment, so the conditions have to be right, sunny, cool, hot, whatever. Um, but the other thing that we tend to forget is that host plant also plays a big part of that. And a lot of times that is how we can affect what we get and what we don't. And then, of course, when we talk about pathogens, there are several different types. I'm not going to dive into every one of them. Just understand fungus is the most common. Um, but And another one that we'll see oftentimes, especially in vegetable gardens, are nematodes which are microscopic roundworms. And then of course, understanding the life cycle, when is it gonna be most common? What do the eggs look like? Um, there are a whole lot of things you can get into, but if you understand the life cycle, oftentimes you have a very good understanding of exactly how to control it for, through a variety of different means. Um, being able to identif identify um, egg sacs are perfect for controlling a lot of different insects. And we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically. Um, but if you can find those, oftentimes you can control the insect altogether without ever doing anything uh, significant. And so a whole lot we can get into that, just understand exactly when to control, how to control, but of course, understanding are there other options as well. All right, so management types. There are, of course, four steps. So we've identified there is a problem. We've determined that a problem needs to be dealt with. Um, oftentimes we, in extension, but anyone who follows the Integrated Pest Management Handbook will oftentimes see this kind of four to five step process. Um, my big thing when it comes to this is you should always be practicing cultural controls. And in my opinion, always be practicing biological controls. Both of these things right off the bat are going to give you, I would argue, the majority of your control when it comes to a lot of these problems. Um, and then of course you get into physical, mechanical, and of course chemical specifically. Um, I will say this doesn't have to happen in order as long as you're following the cultural control completely you, the other three, you can follow as needed. Big thing is prevention. Um, right off the bat, when we talk about diseases, insects, you name it, um, is figuring out the right host. So if you've ever, and I'm going to use tomatoes as an example, if you've ever bought a tomato seed from any store, obviously uh, inorganic um, tomato seeds, you will see a long list of letters next to them. Um, you'll see F's and V's and all these others. Um, specifically, those are there to designate the diseases that these plants have been bred to be resistant to. Now, they are breeding them through uh, conventional means. Um, and so this breeding process does lead to hybrids. So you do get hybridization. So you can't save the seeds from them. But you do get disease resistance. And this alone, I would argue, is one of the best ways to control disease. Um, other ways, of course, uh, to control insects and other things is good crop rotation. Um, don't plant the same thing over and over again. That helps to break up some of the life cycles. But right off the bat, prevention is key. Understanding that host is key. Um, and then next is healthy plants. Healthy plants have fewer problems. If I sit around all day, uh, drinking beer and smoking cigarettes, I'm probably going to have a lot poorer health than someone who goes out and runs a marathon, um, mostly because I'm not keeping myself healthy. And so the same with our plants. We have to keep our plants healthy. 
Um, and the way we do that is proper watering, proper fertility, proper pruning, other things that we can do. Um, again, this all goes back to understanding the crop. And of course, what can I do to make sure my plant is at its peak performance? Whole lot, as I said, um, in reality, it's there is not a you know foolproof way that you are going to culturally control pests. What you are going to do is try to be as successful with the plant you are growing, and generally that in turn will reduce the pest specifically. As I said, there's a whole lot you can get into, um, whether it's mulching, whether it's proper soil management, soil health and fertility, um, plant selection, uh, of course, planting times, watering, mulching. As I said, there's a whole lot we could dive into, but in reality, it's all about understanding, okay, how are these plants cared for and how do I keep them as happy and healthy as possible? Another method that I do recommend um, is oftentimes overlooked, especially for small gardens, um, but as cover cropping, this really goes more into that soil health aspect, but there's a lot of benefits to cover cropping as far as pests go. Um, and I will point out too, one that is pictured here is the yellow, that's uh, wild mustard. Um, kind of keep in mind, wild mustard is a little bit aggressive. It's not considered invasive in here. Um, a lot of those are unfortunately non-native. Uh, but it is a really good cover crop. It produces some natural um, antimicrobial chemicals within its root system that can actually help kind of suppress some of the unhealthy populations of um, pathogens, basically. Uh, there's another one that you can do, of course, is marigolds, African or French marigolds. Um, both of those work fairly well. Marigolds are extremely effective as far as nematode control. Um, which we'll talk a little bit more about with nematodes, but um, cover cropping can also be a good kind of biological practice. And that leads us into biological controls. This is where I would argue is you're kind of always doing this. Um, in reality, you're letting nature do the work for you. That is probably it's one of the more difficult concepts, I think, because as a gardener, you want to have control over everything. But a lot of times having a couple aphids on your milkweed can feed the population of ladybird beetles or um, assassin bugs or whatever that helps to control a whole lot of other things. Um, I will say you generally see good bugs where there are bad bugs. Um, I got a really good example of this for when I was... Um, looking at plant roses in a nursery, um, I saw plenty of thrips on the rose buds. You open up the rose buds, there's so many thrips in there, but guess what I also saw was the minute pirate bug, which is a really good predator for thrips. As I said, you're, you're not gonna have those minute pirate bugs without the thrips themselves. Um, if you allow that thrip pop or that minute pirate bug population to get big enough, they'll control the thrips for the most part. Um, Again, this doesn't always work. Unfortunately, we, we introduce a lot of things. We have a lot of non-natives. Um, we have to be careful because unfortunately nature is really in balance in general. Um, so that's where we come into play to kind of augment uh, and figure out. But in reality, what we are doing is just trying to be more of a conservationist as opposed to anything else. Um, I would say right off the bat, I do not recommend generally releasing beneficial insects. Um, as I mentioned, kind of with anything else, this does upset the balance. You oftentimes, if you release a, lady, a bunch of ladybird beetles, you get a bunch of dead ladybird beetles. Um, there is the ladybug release out at Magnolia that was several years ago. And one of the people out there told me, said that's the next day is the best day for dragonflies which eat ladybugs. And so he said, that's essentially what you're doing is you're feeding the dragonflies. Again, everything has its place, but uh, introduce, introducing a, a giant explosion of population does not generally have the best results. Usually it's more of a waste for everyone's time. Um, there are some pathogens you can use. 
There are some uh, bacteria that you can use as far as like Bt, milky spore, um, some several other ones that do have some effect. It's more on a very specific basis we can talk about, but for the most part, um, there are some, a lot of times you're really not just throwing with anything out there. Um, there is one that might actually be pretty beneficial for most, and that is beneficial nematodes. But again, I'm always cautious to introduce anything that's not naturally already there. Of course, there's lots of other beneficials, predators, parasitoids, you name it. There is a lot. Um, these are very effective natural enemies. Um, predators specifically are kind of generalists, so they're going to eat just about anything they come into, um, whether it is, again, your assassin bugs, whether it's your minute pirate bugs, whatever. Um, parasitoids are going to be very effective at controlling their specific um, target. So you've ever seen the picture of the horn or uh, tomato hornworm that has all the white things coming out of that? That's a parasitoid. What it is, it's a wasp that lays a bunch of eggs inside the caterpillar and they emerge all at once. It's kind of like the scene out of Alien, um, but in the insect world, and it is very effective because that caterpillar dies very quickly. And now you have an explosion in population of your beneficials. Um, there are a lot of species. Right off the bat, I'm always very hesitant to do anything about trolling wasp. Wasp are very important. Um, and they're often maligned because, again, we hear the term wasp, we think bad, bad, bad. Um, when in reality, there are, I mean, 16,000 species of wasps native to North America uh, that are going to be extremely beneficial. There are flies, true bugs, beetles, plenty of others that are beneficial. Again, the list is extensive and they are all very, very important. Um, again, this is where I encourage conservation and of course, planting things to attract them as opposed to releasing them. Of course, mechanical control. This is probably uh, my favorite uh, out of the actual you know, chemical versus mechanical. Um, doesn't leave me that much choice, but mechanical is by far one of my favorites. Um, in terms of I actually get to do something and um, I'm not necessarily just spraying a whole bunch. And so one of my favorite things to do is hand picking um, insects off. You are looking for your hornworms. Um, interesting fact about hornworms is, is they do glow. If you get a black light out um, at night, they do have a glow to them. So they're easy to spot. Um, but you can go out and look through your tomato plants, pick off your hornworms, just wear some gloves. Um, you can pick off Japanese beetles from your various plants. There's a whole lot of things you can do. You put them in some soapy water, you call it a day. Um, Handpicking physical controls are very, very effective. The only problem most people have is they are also very te tedious or time consuming. It takes a long time, especially the larger the area you have to cover. Um, you can do some exclusion methods, things like row covers, which you're basically putting up netting to, to repel insects, um, various different collars around the base of the plant, um, fabrics uh, for weed prevention and others. Um, I've actually seen reflective fabrics for various different insect repellents. A whole lot you can do, that's kind of part of this, but again, just part of it. Uh, again, weed control is pretty simple, just hand pulling weeds, cultivation, things like that. And then, of course, sanitation is a part of this, um, whether we're talking about woody plants, so you're pruning out the dead, diseased, or damaged, or you're removing crop residues at the end of the season. If I've got a diseased tomato, I'm not just cutting it down and leaving it to decay in the soil, I'm removing it all together uh, to prevent that disease or whatever else from overwintering and coming back next year. Good crop rotation also reduces the um, residual effects of a lot of these diseases as well. And then chemical control. Uh, again, I don't have to be too much into it um, to really emphasize this is really the last step that we would want to do. Um, basically, we want everything else. If we have to do something, this is the one that we're kind of like, all right, I guess I have to. There's a lot of various different ones. I mentioned BT earlier, Bacillus thuringiensis. That is a really good uh, compound that's often con considered chemical. 
um, that works for caterpillars, but various different ones. Again, chemicals are used extensively. We're trying to reduce as much as we can. Two categories, conventional and biorational. Biorational is the ones that we tend to focus on the most, um, which are the reduced risks. So I'm very, I put those in quotations because in, re, in reality, um, any type of chemical you put on still carries some risk to it. Even if it's reduced, it is not necessarily something that I would call um, kind of problematic or problem free or anything like that. Um, they tend to have a shorter shelf life, lower residue, um, slower acting, things like that. It's really more about specific mode of, modes of action. BT, of course, only affects caterpillars, which means if I put it on some aphids, it's not going to do a whole lot. Um, you know, there are various different ones that are going to work on various different insects. It's all about critical application times as well. Um, conventional, of course, is going to be your pyrethroids. That's going to be um, your neonicotinoids, your other basic in, um, chemicals. Um, your basic fungicides, basic insecticides, things like that. Um, generally conventional, they're very effective. Um, and again, I don't think you should take them off your tool shelf, but I also think you should not go to those first, which unfortunately we have a habit as a society to just go to the easiest one first. So a couple soft products or biorational products. BT, I've already mentioned a couple times. Um, insecticidal soaps kind of smother plants. Those work really well. Um, I quite like the way those are working. Um, neem oils, um, any type of oils are really good for your kind of piercing, sucking pests. Then, of course, you've got your spinosads. Um, spinosad, I will say, is a little bit harder soft product, mostly because it will kill just about anything it comes into contact with, though it is very effective for um, because it does have a locally systemic um, process. So it will actually get through the cuticle of the leaf and it is very good for controlling things like leaf miner and stuff like that. And then pyrethrins, pyrethrins of course are the, I guess, parent product of pyrethroids, which are um, gonna be synthetic pyrethrins. These pyrethroids of course are gonna be very effective Pyrethrins are fairly effective, but um, we call them soft products because they're naturally derived, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily soft. So again, in one of those you have to be a little bit careful with. You know, soaps work really well as far as a lot of your various different insects. Oils, um, I really like the use of dormant oils, especially in a lot of kind of more traditional ornamental plants. Um, but again, heat is going to be a big limiting factor. Um, it just kind of be aware of this. Um, these are probably one of the softest products because there is no active ingredient. Um, pest resistance very unlikely because of that. Of course, um, really the ones controlled by oils are going to be aphids, caterpillars, overwintering mites, stuff like that. Summer applications you have to be careful with. That's one of the big reasons why that's on there. Um, your problem is, is most of the ones you would control with oils, unfortunately, are most active during the summer. The neem oils are one I do kind of want to mention. It is, of course, um, it technically has a active ingredient. So it is, it does have an insect growth regulator that it, it affects a lot of different insects. Um, it is very effective, though. And neem oil is an excellent product for, for those who maybe don't who who don't know that this there are softer products out there, and so this one works very well. Um, still an oil, so you have to be careful when it's really hot. And then, of course, you've got some of your um, bacteria, microbial insecticides, um, various different bacterias um, that are going to work. There's actually ones that can kill off Colorado potato beetle. Um, there's ones that kill off certain caterpillars, um, mosquitoes, black flies, fungus gnats wax moths, you name it. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of strains of Bacillus, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, but um, again, it's very, very specific as far as what it controls. You can't just spray and say, I don't need to worry about insects now. Um, then I wanted to mention your milky spore. 
which is Bacillus populi and um, Bacillus lentimorbus, just naturally occurring bacteria, works really well for controlling white grubs in your soil, specifically the larval form of Japanese beetles and various other beetles as well. It's been a sad, as I mentioned, uh, it's a toxin from, it's another one of those toxins that's derived naturally, um, but keep in mind, it does work on a lot of different insects. It's a really good, I would say, again, a harder soft product. It's a really good one to have because it does work very well on a lot of different plants or a lot of different insects. Problem is, it is toxic to bees like certain other ones. And so, as I said, that's why I don't call this necessarily a soft product. Beneficial nematodes, I kind of mentioned that previously. Uh, getting that into your soil is a really good way to kind of boost um, natural controls. Again, still a little bit soft or hesitant on just putting something out for no reason unless I have a problem. Um, mostly because I would like whatever is there naturally to be able to control it for me. And then pyrethrins, again, there's a whole lot of issues that can be problematic from this. So just be very aware of these do exist. Certain pyrethrins are labeled organic or OMRI certified. I still would be very, very cautious on all of these. And then real quick on chemical fungal control. Um, when it comes to soft products, there's really only three, copper, sulfur, and neem. Um, we use copper because, again, it's kind of a naturally occurring metal. It does have a very good broad spectrum um, antimicrobial properties. Um, sulfur is very similar, but breaks down very quickly. And then, of course, neem oil only works against powdery mildew. Um, again, it really is going to be very dependent. Disease is one of those areas that I'm much more focused. If I have to get the chemical, I'm almost thinking it's not worth it because um, chemical control, even if I'm using conventional products, is very, very difficult. Okay. That was a lot of information regarding IPM beneficials, various other things. Um, I know that was a lot, but. Now we're going to dive into the common pest and disease in edible gardening. Uh, we're about halfway through. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to drop them in the chat. Uh, but this one, we're kind of now focus specifically on um, some things that we might actually see. This is not a, an exclusive list. Um, there are lots of things that you might see and say, he didn't mention that. That is fine. Um, I'm not going to go through everything. We'd be here all day if I did. Unfortunately, we have a long growing season for plants. That also means we have a long growing season for both pests and disease. And so with the heat, humidity, and overall poor soil quality, um, gardening can be very challenging. And a lot of these problems are pretty common within our landscapes. So I'm going to go through three different areas. Arthropods, which are going to include mollusks and arachnids, but really focus mostly on insects. And if you're curious to know why there's difference, there is. We won't get into the anatomy and physiology of it, but there are differences between the three. Um, and then, of course, we'll dive into some disease problems. So specifically fungal, bacterial, and water molds. But um, I will mention nematodes, root knot nematodes specifically. And then, of course, I do want to touch on a few abiotic issues, again, not caused by a living thing. And if you're curious why, what the picture is to the left, that is of fall webworms. Fall webworms specifically affect uh, very, various different species of trees, but one of our edible trees, the pecan, is notorious for getting this. Um, not usually problematic, a really good example of one that's unsightly, but almost rarely a, a problem enough to where I need to go out and treat. Um, hard to treat, but they are all in one space, which is kind of nice. Okay, arthropods. We're really going to break this up into four categories. For the most part, only two of them are going to be major. Um, the other two, not necessarily. Um, so you've got really four different categories, and this is how we're going to divide them up. 
in general for our um, kind of macro organisms. So insects, mollusks, um, various other arachnids, which really only includes mites. But this is all going to be based on the type of damage they do. So chewing mouth parts. So there are insects that have essentially teeth. I mean, they don't have bones, they're invertebrates, but they do have teeth. Uh, things like caterpillars, grasshoppers, um, various beetles, these uh, some certain true bugs even, um, are going to have strong mandibles that are going to actually chew plant material. You're probably guessing, well, how would I ever know that's the case? Well, uh, the obvious holes missing from the plant uh, and I kid, obviously, but uh, the holes missing from the plant is a good indication of what those are. Um, the other one that's not really, I don't consider chewing mouth parts to be overly serious, mostly because if it's in a small scale, a couple holes in the leaves have almost zero effect on the overall health of the plant. High enough populations, any of this can be a problem, but um, gall makers are the other one that I don't really consider a pest. Um, if you ever want to get into the uh, the weird world of ecology in general, you can get into galls. Um, galls are basically tumor-like structures on plants. They look really rough. Um, uh, insects can cause this. Uh, bacteria, fungi can cause this. Um, it has relatively no effect on the overall plant health, but they look rough. Um, and they happen for a variety of different reasons. Um, probably the best example, if you ever want to get a good close look at what a gall would look like. Go out to the closest live oak, look at some of the leaves. You'll see some brown hardened bumps on them that's caused by a wasp. Um, again, not generally an issue. Um, then you've got your piercing, sucking mouth parts. These are the mouth parts basically that are giant straws. When I say giant, but for insects, they're pretty big. Um, these are the straws that they pierce into the plant tissue and they pull out the materials, often pull out sap. Um, white flies, scales, mealybugs, aphids, these are probably the most common pests in the home garden, um, but the most common pest in general. These are the ones that mostly are going to cause the most damage for the relative kind of commonality for them. And then, of course, um, you have your wood or flowing borders, borers, I'm not going to spend too much time on these for the most part. Um, these are going to include um, like your ambrosia beetles, um, like your Asian longhorn beetles, the ones that are really they're killing the tree if they're there and they usually spread disease. Um, we won't dive too much more into those. Not really many controls for them. It's more just, hey, they're there. So if I'm looking for insects, signs. And I guess insects, not just insects, but uh, various other things as well. Um, signs are what they leave behind right off the bat. And probably one of the best examples of this, probably the one that I see the most, is called sooty mold. Um, so sooty mold, of course, is the picture in the right. It's kind of hard to see. Apologize the way it uh, um, formatted on this for the pictures, but that's okay. Uh, but sooty mold, basically the leaf turns black. Um, you can take your fingernail and scrape off the black material. It comes right off because it's completely on the surface. It's not a disease. The sooty mold is a fungus, but it is not pathogenic. Um, it is there. It is colonizing the honeydew, which is the sticky substance released by your piercing, sucking insects like whitefly, scales, mealybugs, aphids. Um, very good, easy way to spot those insects. Unfortunately, by the time you see sooty mold or honeydew, that population is pretty high. So not always the way I would spot them, but it is a good way to spot them. Um, fecal spots. So if you see lots of what look to be just little brown dots, little black dots, you can probably guess what those are. Um, caterpillars produce a lot of poop. Um, and that's kind of just a blunt way of saying, if you have caterpillars, you're probably going to get a lot of fecal spots. Um, tents, webs, silken mats, um, uh, spider mites produce webs, um, your web worms produce webs, tents, things like that. Um, these are usually a good indication of a very specific pest. Uh, slime, slime, obviously, for a lot of our mollusks. 
snails, slugs specifically, will leave tr slime trails. Um, and then, of course, the, the one that I always find the most fun to see, though not always the best indicator, is flocculants, which is that white powdery substance that you see on the bottom picture, oftentimes in relation to certain aphids, scales, or even mealybugs. Um, I've seen it on others as well, but it's basically a material they use to protect themselves. So I've already mentioned the mouth parts. For the most part, we're not going to talk a whole lot about rasping or sponging. If you want to know what sponging is, just think of what a fruit fly does. But chewing, piercing, and sucking are two big ones. So sap sucking or piercing sucking insects, um, as I said, usually cause indirect damage. So they're not actually affecting the overall uh, crop, but they are, of course, affecting the plant itself. And what this means is it is affecting the health. The more um, sooty mold you get on a plant, generally the less photosynthetic activity you're going to get, but also generally the less healthy that plant is going to be overall. Aphids are by far the most common one. You know, I see aphids more than I see any other insect in the garden. They reproduce fast. Um, and they can cause a lot of damage very quickly. But for the most part, just about any beneficial you think of has some control over aphids. So uh, aphids are a, there's a love-hate relationship because in reality, you want to have some aphid population in order to feed your beneficial population. And then, of course, you've got things like spider mites, um, which are not an insect. They're an, arth or they're an arachnid um, related to spiders. They're a mite. Um, spider mites, there's actually several different types of mites that can, can affect plants. Um, you don't see mites nearly as much. They're much harder to control. Um, generally, I see spider mites mostly on house plants, but occasionally on outdoor plants, especially when they're drought stressed. Um, white fly, uh, this is a flying white insect. Uh, if you walk by, if you touch a plant and a bunch of white specks fly out at you, that's white fly. It's one of the easiest ones to identify. Um, scales. Scales are much harder to identify. They've gotten better at hiding themselves. Most, but the thing is, is they are going to be immobile. They do not move around on the plant. Mealybugs do move around. They are theoretically related to scales, but distantly. But um, all of those are going to kind of be your more common ones. Um, I already mentioned aphids. Definitely a rough one to run into. Um, you can oftentimes squish these pretty easily, but there's so many of them that you're going to spend a whole lot of time doing so. And unfortunately, they do stain whatever you're using to squish with. Spider mites, as I said, uh, the arachnids, these are very fast to reproduce. You can get a very heavy infestation very quickly. Um, you generally see populations explode more in plants that are A, stressed, or B, being oversprayed mostly because there's a lot of beneficials that help control them. They can cause very significant damage very quickly. Um, but again, if you have a low enough population, you'll lose a couple leaves and that's really it. White flies. White flies, of course, are going to be um, small flying insects. Very simple as that. Um, generally, you will see a little bit of flocculants associated with them, but mostly I see sooty mold and honeydew. They are piercing and pulling out sap as fast as they can. Um, much more common in greenhouses than I see them outdoors, mostly because there's a lot of beneficials that control them. Thrips, I did not mention thrips, or I did mention thrips a little bit when I talked about the minute uh, pirate bug, but they're, they are a problem in a lot of different plants, mostly because they can affect um, the overall development of leaves and the overall development of fruits, um, they can spread viruses. This is one of those that generally, if you have a really dry spring, you'll have a lot more thrips. Um, you see this mostly on tomatoes and watermelons. I don't see it a whole lot in peppers, but it can. Um, it can affect a whole lot of different plants. The big thing is, is you want to make sure that you have healthy plants that are well watered, and of course, you have a good, healthy population of beneficials, which just means you're not necessarily treating for every insect you see. 
Slugs. Now, slugs are not technically a insect. They are a mollusk. Mollusks, slugs, and snails. Um, these are going to have rasping mouth parts. So they are, they're going to kind of have chewing mouth parts, essentially. We call them rasping because it's a little bit more archaic version of them. They affect a lot of different plants. Now, the big thing about these, they tend to be nocturnal. And the only way most people see them is by that trail of slime. And I see these a lot on leafy vegetables, um, you know, spinach, kale, cabbage, stuff like that. There are a lot of different tricks and tips. Most of them are very effective, um, whether you're putting out a, a, a jug of beer or you're doing something else to, to control them. A lot of different methods to controlling slugs. I rarely run into this being a major problem. Again, beneficials do most of the work for me. Beetles, of course, you've got your occasional beetles. These are June beetles, Japanese beetles. Um, I find physical control to be the most effective. And I'm probably already got people thinking, well, what about that increase in population I had this year, which a lot of people did. In fact, it was a bad year for Japanese beetles. Um, I picked off a total of four in my entire yard, um, which just means I have gotten that population to a point where I feel very comfortable controlling um, through mechanical means. Until you get to that point, um, a lot of times you have to utilize things like traps. You have to utilize things like milky spore, a whole lot of different methods you can do. Um, these are hard to control, though, with your basic insecticides. Usually I get the call, uh, I've been sprinkling seven dust on my tomatoes constantly. Um, that's unfortunately, by that point, you might as well just block the, the um, tomatoes because you put up enough chemicals in them. But unfortunately, they're not going to last long enough to really you have that much effect on the overall population. Flea beetles, on the other hand, are a little bit more problematic. I see these a lot on sweet potatoes, which are one of my go-to summer crops. Um, these are going to cause a lot of damage on kind of the leaves themselves, leave a lot of shot holes. Um, basically, it looks like someone's been raining uh, buckshot all over my plants. And unfortunately, yeah, it can look fairly problematic. But in reality, if you have healthy plants, you can have some population of this and not really be a problem. That being said, they can grow to be a problem very quickly. Um, they do jump when they are disturbed, hence why they have the name flea beetle. Colorado potato beetle, on the other hand, uh, this is actually, interestingly enough, the Colorado potato beetle, before they made their way east, um, were actually a crop, they were a pest mostly on a specific Solanaceae plant. Um, and I'm trying to remember the specific name. I cannot, but it, it was basically, uh, it was a kind of like a nightshade. It did not affect potatoes at all until it made its way farther east and found potatoes and realized, hey, these are much tastier. And unfortunately, can affect all Solanaceous crops. So if you're familiar, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes are all in the same pan. The big thing with these is finding your egg masses early enough and picking them off and squishing them. Blister beetles, uh, some of them actually can be beneficial, especially the immature forms. And then of course, some of the adults can be leaf feeders. Again, really good example of kind of one that would be, is it worth treating? You get large enough groups, they can be very damaging. The best thing to do is avoid handling them, though, um, and only treating if you start to see a lot of them together. Cucumber beetles, same concept. You're looking for that group of, same concept as the color of potato beetle. You're looking for that egg mass that you see on the top picture. It's small bronze, copper-colored egg masses, squish them, that generally is going to be much more effective. Affects all cucurbits, so not just cucumbers, but squash and others. Uh, definitely much more damaging to smaller plants, so just be aware you don't have to necessarily look on your mature squash that's been producing for months. You really just need to focus more on the plants you just planted. 
On the other hand, squash bugs can be much more damaging. Uh, these are going to also have those egg masses usually towards the base of the plant. Um, these are going to be somewhat issue, somewhat of an issue. Um, if you don't catch them, they look very similar to stink bugs. They can do a lot of damage, especially to small plants. So just be aware of that. Versus stink bugs, and these, their egg masses are very easy to identify. It looks like someone built little miniature barrels. That is exactly what it looks like. These barrel-shaped egg masses are usually attached to leaves in clusters, and they're usually found on the bottom of the leaves. Most eggs are. You find these, squish them. That usually is a very good way to control them. Um, stink bugs damage a lot of different plants. Uh, and can be somewhat hard to control once the population builds up, usually late summer. Leaf-footed bugs, this is much more common one in my opinion than stink bugs. Uh, they tend to feed mostly on fruit. Exclusively stink bugs can feed on other parts as well. Um, easy way to identify these is by the back legs. They have a flattened leaf shape back leg. Pretty easy to identify. Um, same management as stink bugs, plant early and look for egg masses. Um, but there is another thing you can do, and you probably have not heard of what a trap crop is, but trap crop just means that I am putting, I am planting plants specifically to pull away our pests. Um, planting a field of sunflowers, you'll never notice the leaf-footed bugs on them, and generally that just means they're not on your actual squash, tomatoes, things like that. Harlequin bugs, I see these a lot on brassicas, um, especially brassicas late in the spring. Um, these oftentimes are misidentified as ladybird beetles, but are harlequin bugs. Same barrel-shaped eggs. They have those black bands um, on them. Now, they are active throughout the winter, as well as late fall and early spring. Um, generally, once the heat hits, they go away. Um, but man, if you leave those brassicas too late, oftentimes you'll have lots of these. Now, caterpillar pests come in a lot of different forms, but one of my least favorite is pictured here on the left it is the squash vine borer. And as you can probably guess, uh, it is a boring caterpillar and it gets inside the stem and chews and chews and chews until that vine dies. They are horrible to handle, horrible to control, and if you grow squash, it's not if you'll get them, but when. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Cutworms, these are usually problematic for small plants, newly emerged seedlings. Best thing to do, just keep the weeds down. If you plant early enough, you're not usually running into this problem, and if you are planting too late, or late summer, early fall, with your second crop, then best thing to do is just keep it weed-eated and or control those weeds oftentimes are where they're housed in order to get to your actual plants. As the name implies, they cut the plant at the base, kills it. Tomato hornworm. Uh, tomato hornworms are, of course, as the name implies, they really like tomatoes. Um, there's actually two different ones. There's tomato hornworm and tobacco hornworm. Um, we're not generally growing a whole lot of tobacco, I hope, uh, but if you are, you're going to get both, um, but most people run into just the tomatoes. Um, they can affect eggplants and peppers, but really prefer tomatoes. Um, Handpicking them is the most effective, or allowing your beneficials to control them is really the most effective. Unfortunately, you're going to get a few years where that population explodes, um, but if you're handpicking them, my favorite place, my favorite thing to do is I handpick them, put them in a cup with nothing in it, and I go dump that cup into a bird feeder. The birds will be very thankful for it. And then the bane of my existence when it comes to squash, zucchini, um, various different other cucurbits, but squash vine borer, um, as the name implies, it's a caterpillar. The moth lays its eggs at the very base of the plant when it's small, or really just at any point that egg emerges, that caterpillar drills a very, very tiny little hole that you'll never, ever see. 
um, into it and then starts to eat its way throughout the entire trunk. Eventually, when it gets big enough, you'll see it produces a lot of this yellow type substance. It's called frass or it's poop. Fortunately, it will kill the plant. Um, you, there are some trip, tips and tricks. The key is, is planting at the appropriate time. So plant early, making sure that you are, of course, getting it before the, the heat hits. Excuse me. But also um, really making sure that you are either that or planting it late enough to where once the full heat is, you'll see fewer of them. Usually you will avoid the heaviest population if you do that. And of course, remove, you know, good crop rotation, remove the, the crop when it's done. And of course, avoiding any type of overlay with that. But the one thing that I have actually found, there's kind of two methods that you can use to control them. You can use reflective mulches. So putting, you know, aluminum foil or reflective plastic around the base of the plant, that does seem to have some benefit to it. Or, and one that I have seen have very good work, is what's known as floating row covers. And essentially, when the plant's really small, you put a netting over the plant. It prevents the caterpillars from getting in there, the, the moths from laying eggs, at least until the plant is big enough to start to flower. Once it flowers, you remove the row covers because you need the, the, the pollinators. By then, you may get an infestation, but at least you'll get some crops first. So... There are some tips and tricks. You can remove them physically if you get out a pair of scalpels, but not necessarily the way I would recommend. And pickle and melon worms, these are very frustrating, but usually relatively minor. Plant early, you're fine. Um, if you get enough, you generally don't have a problem. But as you can see in my personal hand, that is a zucchini that has a beautiful pickle worm. And unfortunately, they can bore into fruit. Um, I will say if you see any holes in the fruits, I would not recommend eating. It is definitely a scare when you run into um, you run into these cutting them up. Army worms, of course, is another one that you'll run into. Uh, army worms, of course, uh, affect the home vegetable garden. Uh, these include beet army worms, yellow striped army worms, uh, various other things. Um, these mainly feed on the foliage. I see a lot of these. Uh, unfortunately, these are problematic. Um, and of course, uh, these as the name implies, come in very large masses altogether. Um, unfortunately, uh, not something that I generally prefer to have. Can be rather difficult to control, but a lot of times beneficials tend to take care of it for you. And then diamondback moths. Um, this is another one that I run into that is rather problematic as well. Um, this is unfortunately... Uh, these are going to be focused mostly on brassicas. Generally, you won't see these nearly as bad. Um, unless you, again, have a large brassica field, but again, can cause very, very heavy infestations. There's a lot of research being done on diamondback moths. Uh, similar to the uh, imported cabbage worm. Imported cabbage worm, of course, uh, it, as the name implies, is imported. Um, usually beneficials will control most of these, but if you see these, you do need to try to control these via ET. Cross stripe cabbage worm. As you can probably guess, brassicas get the most caterpillars. Cabbage worms specifically, um, it's kind of similar again. Lots of fecal spots you'll get. And then cabbage looper, uh, this is one that is going to defoliate plants as well. Um, I see this the most. In reality, with most brassicas, this is the problem I run into the most. All right, now I want to dive into diseases real quick. Um, and unfortunately, it definitely is a problem. 
right. We've kind of already talked about the diseases. Um, but here's a couple different types. So really, we we base diseases based on uh, their their pathogen. So their pathogen, of course, is going to be fungus, water molds, bacteria, nematodes, and viruses. Um, there's actually a couple other ones that we can argue that are included in that. But these are kind of your more standard um, pathogens. All right. So different diseases obviously are going to affect different plants. So um, right off the bat, there are plants that are going to or diseases that are going to be very specific to plants. Um, certain rust are only going to affect certain plants, um, certain fusarium wilts, viruses, things like that. Then you have plants that are diseases that affect whole families. Uh, and this is where, you know, late blight of potato and tomato, bacterial spot, downy mildew, Again, this the big concept with this right off the bat is to understand that diseases and um, insects also are going to generally be more focused on specific families and species as opposed to just being generalists. There are some generalist diseases and in insects, but for the most part, when I have a disease, I'm not worried about my live oak giving my magnolia anything because they're in two very different families. Big thing with avoiding diseases, um, big thing with avoiding diseases, of course, is going to be um, understanding, again, that disease triangle. Um, and so that's going to be understanding pet disease free transplants. So making sure that we're buying good plants. Um, we are finding, um, we are, of course, practicing good crop rotation, so we're not planting the same family over and over again. Uh, we are planting disease-resistant cultivars, uh, and of course, planting at the proper time, trellising, irrigating, doing all these things. This is a good way to kind of focus on the host plant uh, and to help kind of keep those plants as healthy as possible, that'll reduce the environmental situation that'll allow the pathogen, because oftentimes the pathogen is already there. So real quick, I want to run through these types of diseases, mostly because we only have uh, a few more minutes left, and I want to leave a little bit of time for any questions. Um, but right off the bat, when we talk about types of diseases, it's all going to be based on where they're from. So you've got soil-borne diseases. Of course, soil-borne diseases, as the name implies, are that found in the soil. Um, you also have seed-borne diseases. That is not super common, but it is one I wanted to mention because if you are saving any types of seeds, just be aware um, that saving seeds can oftentimes limit sometimes the plants you're growing. And of course, um, you want to also be aware if you are buying untreated seeds. Um, then you have your uh, wind and waterborne pathogens. These are probably the most common, uh, at least that we run into. Um, and then you have um, your insect vector pathogens, which I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on. But soil-borne, of course, these are found in the soil. Really, really simple things like your nematodes, your root rots, your bacterial rots, things like that. Um, uh, then you also have um, nematodes. Nematodes is probably the most common soil borne that people are going to actually run into that they recognize. They're very easy to identify, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But generally, this is going to be a fungal group that is just, it's too wet, or the plant is already somewhat unhealthy. Um, these are generally going to be the things that you uh, see because of this. And as the name implies, it's found in the soil. And the one thing I will say right off the bat, we are not going to sterilize our soil. 
Um, damping off, probably the most common um, problem for seedlings if you're overwatering. It's caused by both a water mold and a fungus. Water mold is technically different, uh, but that is uh, Pythium and, of course, Rhizoctonia. Um, but these are very common root rots that happen, especially for seedlings. And so, unfortunately, can be rather, rather problematic. Um, and then, of course, you have stem and crown or crown and stem rots. This can happen in older plants, especially from something like Rhizoctonia, um, various different like southern blights and things like that. Um, you'll see the, uh, with things like tomatoes, eggplants. Big thing is to avoid overwatering, especially for your seedlings. Bacterial spec. Um, I see this one a lot on tomatoes. Um, this one, again, found in the soil. So unfortunately, there's not really a treatment for it. Um, best thing to do, of course, is going to be uh, to good crop rotation, but also to really focus on if you do have it, um, maybe get some bacterial resistant tomatoes. And then nematodes, as I mentioned, um, the reason why these are easy to identify is when you pull out that plant and you see all these wart-like structures on the roots, those are nematodes right off the bat. They affect most dicotyledonous plants, so any plant that's not a grass, uh, and unfortunately are very, very difficult to control. Um, now, there are some ways to control it. Um, root non nematodes, only one of them. Um, but if you are going to control nematodes, this is where you're going to have to really get creative because chemicals, unfortunately, are not generally an option. Um, so marigolds, of course, I mentioned cover cropping marigolds. We're not talking about interplanting with marigolds. We're talking about a full cover throughout the entire field. Uh, marigolds work very, very well. If you do this for two seasons, you'll pretty much get rid of your um, nematodes. And then things like crab shells, I've heard, have fairly decent effects in solarization as well. And then you've got your seed born. Again, this is just about focusing on, all right, let me make sure I am not keeping seeds that are affected. I am treating the seeds appropriately. And of course, if I am buying any seeds, I am buying seeds that have been hopefully treated. Um, a lot of bacterial diseases can be spread this way, bacterial specifically, um, but you also see it on certain viruses as well as fungal rots. Things like late blight is a perfect example. Technically not seed borne, I know, but late blight is unfortunately spread through tubers. Um, and if you're familiar with the Irish potato famine, this is what caused it, late blight. And it was just... It was poor crop rotation and it was poor um, tuber management, unfortunately. Black rot's another one. If you have grown brassicas, you've likely gotten black rot. Um, I would argue you're probably not going to grow them without getting it, um, but it does come a lot of times from the seeds themselves. Wind and soil-borne pathogens. Um, this is the, again, most common group that people are familiar with, mostly because it's the easiest to identify. Um, these are the ones spread through the wind uh, and, and or water. Um, downy mildew specifically moves with water or um, with uh, weather patterns. Powdery mildew, if you are going outside, you will see powdery mildew right off the bat. Uh, so powdery mildew affects a lot of different plants. Um, unfortunately, it, it is very common. The good news is, is it generally only affects the surface of the leaf. So it is, um, basically it builds up a structure on the surface of the leaf. And then of course, once that it gets heavy enough, that leaf will lose its phot photosynthetic activity and unfortunately start to decline. Um, easily controlled by just about any fungicide. Um, unfortunately, though, if you're trying to avoid using fungicides, it can be very difficult. Um, picking out the leaves doesn't do much. It is spread through the wind anyways. Um, the good news is, is it doesn't generally affect the plant until it gets really heavy in infestations. Um, and thracnose, this is one that unfortunately is very problematic. Um, this one is just if you get it, pull it out. You're not really going to treat it. Um, it happens a lot in strawberries, but other plants as well, like watermelons, as you see here. Um, generally, once you see it, if you are treating it, 
and it's not working, pull out the plant. If you are not, you might want to start. Unfortunately, even then, it's not generally controlled super well. Downy mildew, this one moves through the water uh, weather patterns, as I mentioned. Um, there's actually a cucurbit downy mildew forecast where you can figure out when it's going to hit this area. Actually, it can be rather damaging, unfortunately, um, and unfortunately is very much an issue. You can preventatively treat for it, but downy mildew is, again, another one of those that once you have it, it's rarely easy to control. And even good crop rotation is not going to be 100%, mostly because those plants um, are going to get it eventually anyways through the weather patterns. And then I want to mention a few abiotic disorders. Um, this just is, again, whether it's nutrient, mechanical, environmental conditions, I just want to mention a really a few couple ones. So one of the most common, of course, um, are going to be things like sun scald. Sun scald, of course, is when the fruit is exposed to too much sunlight. Usually you get sun scald when the plant is already unhealthy, so it's losing foliage, because oftentimes that foliage is actually there to protect the fruits themselves. Um, you can also get things like edema, which happens from too much or too little water. Um, a good example of something similar to this, which is blossom end rot, um, it happens when the plant tomatoes specifically, but you also see them on squash, don't get enough calcium. And it's also a lot of times due to uh, too little or too much water, too little water. Um, you also see this with fruit splitting, especially on tomatoes, that's too much water all at once. Um, a whole lot of things that you can see in the nutrient defoliate deficiencies as well. Okay, I know that was a lot. There was a whole lot more we could dive into, but for today's lesson. That is all I have. Um, I can leave you with a picture of edema. Um, those are just warts, water-filled warts. Um, but I don't, I only have one. I don't have any questions in the chat, um, but I am going to let y'all know that after this, we are going to be sending out a survey. So for the remainder of the Edible Garden series, or for, or for at least the next year, um, we are going to be um, using a specific survey um, that is focused on trying to determine a variety of different issues. Um, obviously, I would really appreciate it if everyone can fill one out. I am going to be sending it out via email after this, probably either today or tomorrow. Uh, and then, of course, um, I do have one question that popped up while I was mentioning that. Uh, diatomaceous earth. So, Stacy, diatomaceous earth is an excellent product. Um, it's really good for indoor problems, mostly because it's generally food and pet safe. Um, it's just silicon dioxide. It is. Uh, it actually will break up the um, exoskeleton of certain invertebrates and does actually help to dry them out. It works really well in, um, I would say, weather controlled or climate controlled situations. You get a, a rain event, it washes away. Unfortunately, it works really well, but for a very limited amount of time. Well, as usual, thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, obviously, if you have any other questions, concerns, you're always welcome to reach out directly to me. And hopefully I'll see you all at the next thing that we should be advertising very soon. And of course, thank you all so much.